Okay, today I'm going to focus on Dickens's love life, on the women that he was roman romantically involved with, and how those women resurface, fictionalized in his novels. So uh, the extent to which he made use of, as it were, for fictional purposes, real women, women who played an important part in his own life, that's the subject of today's lecture. So there's been quite a lot written about this already, and uh, if you take a look, you will find there are numerous books and articles on the subject. You'll find, for example, Charles Dickens and the Image of Woman by David Holbrook in 1993. You'll find Dickens's Women by Anne Isber in 2011. Uh, sorry, Anne Isber. You'll find Michael Slater's Dickens and Women from 1983. And above all, you'll find Claire Tomlin's The Invisible Woman. Now, a major motion picture. And like any motion picture, it capitalizes on the, the sex the romance, the emotion, and the passion. It's not necessarily 100% accurate. You'd do better to read Claire Tomlin's book to, to get a, a, a proper sense of who Nellie Turnan was and the part that she played in Dickens's life, but it will give you some sort of insight. So I'd like to start with the invisible woman, Nellie Turnham. Dickens met her in middle life when he was in his uh, 40s. Uh, she was a young girl, still uh, a young woman, at the age of 18. It's easy to blame their relationship for the breakup of his Dickens's marriage, but frankly I think his marriage was doomed already. And uh, a year after meeting Ellen, he and his wife separated. It wasn't a full divorce. Dickens did not divorce his wife, but he separated from her. They lived apart. By contrast, he remained close to Nellie until his death. There's no proof that they were actual lovers, but uh, most critics, I think, would accept that they were. Most scholars would say, yes, that on balance, that seems to be more or less um, not 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 one hundred percent sure, but but a fairly a fairly certain uh, hypothesis. But he never made the relationship public, so uh, in that sense, uh, we don't really know. Even when the two of them, Nellie and Dickens, were travelling together in a train which crashed in 1865, uh, he prevented the secret of their relationship from being made known. He, he was something of a hero on that day, and he was tending to stick um, to, to injured passengers, but he kept Nellie out of the picture, even, even in that kind of crisis situation. And she certainly had an effect on his writing. She is at least partly the inspiration behind uh, quite a number of characters, especially in the late, well, obviously in the later novels from the time that he met her uh, in his mid 40s. So um, we've got Lucy Manette from A Tale of Two Cities, we've got the ominous Estella from Great Expectations, uh, Bella Wilfer in Our Mutual Friend, Rosa Bud in The Mystery of Edwin Drood. So she, as a personality, infiltrated uh, his writings in uh, fictionalized form. Of course, there's no Ellen Turner, no Nellie in the novels as such, but he has drawn on aspects of her character, her personality, and even uh, his relationship with her in 
his novels. Okay, let's go back to Dickens's first love as a young man and uh, see the, the, the history of his emotional life before he met Nellie. Well, when he was a mere 18 years old, he met a very attractive young woman called Maria Beadnell. She was the daughter of a banker. She was a couple of years older than he was, and he fell in love with her. Her father didn't approve of the relationship. Dickens at this time was um, an unknown. He was an aspiring writer. He was basically writing for newspapers, and he, he, he uh, was considered to be far below the daughter of a successful banker as an eligible husband. So the father disapproved. Very much the situation that we get in David Copperfield, where David again meets a beautiful young uh, daughter of a successful banker, uh, businessman, who uh, disapproves of the marriage. Well, in real life, what happened was that the father sent his daughter to Paris, partly, I think, to get her away from Dickens. And when she got back, she was fairly cold. She, 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 didn't, uh, she didn't show any interest in carrying on the friendship. And Dickens had to accept that the relationship was, um, was over. And she, Maria, was very much the model for Dora Spenlow in David Copperfield. As I say, the, the circumstances were very similar to uh, what happened in real life, a disapproving father and so on. The difference being that in David Copperfield, uh, he, he, the author could kill off the disapproving father who, who dies um, and quite suddenly, and uh, then David is able to marry Dora. So in the novel, David gets to marry Dora, whereas in real life, uh, Dickens did not get to marry Maria Beadnell. It's interesting, though, that even in the novel, he, he seems to be pretty aware that it wouldn't necessarily have been the best thing in the world if he had married her. He loved her passionately. He adored her. But she was not practical. And Dora uh, is a rather silly uh, woman, uh, lovely, but totally impractical. And uh, there's a sort of certain realism in Dickens's presentation of her that he, he kind of knows that she wouldn't have made uh, a, a perfect wife in certain ways. And again, she uh, emerges a few years later on, but in a very different kind of way in uh, Little Dorrit as Flora Finchling. We can see a woman whom Dickens has not met for many years. This is Maria Beadnell, and uh, he did meet her again, and after meeting her, uh, he wrote Little Dorrit and gave us the portrait of Flora Finchling. Well, when he wrote David Copperfield, he hadn't been in contact with Maria for a long time. And so, in a sense, she's just the very attractive young woman that he remembered. And, as I say, he has some sense that she's perhaps a little bit silly, a little bit frivolous, not very practical and so on, but she's nevertheless adorable. But by the time he comes to write Little Dorrit, something important has happened. He had been, again, in contact with Maria, and he was horrified by how, the, how much she had changed in the 20 years since their youthful romance. She was married. She was Mrs. Winter. She wrote a letter to Dickens describing herself as toothless, fat, old and ugly. Uh, Dickens would have none of it. Um, he was determined to meet her, and um, and when he did, he was horrified. 
he was deeply shocked to find that, well, basically, she'd been telling the truth. And, as I say, this middle-aged um, Maria Beadnell became um, satirised in Little Dorrit as the character Flora Finchling showed here in a 2008 movie version. We can see Dickens really very much describing his meeting with Maria in the way that he talks about Flora in Little Dorrit. Flora, always tall, had grown to be very broad too, and short of breath, but that was not much. He was prepared to forgive it. Flora, whom he had left a lily, had become a peony, but that was not much. He could forgive these changes in her physical appearance. Flora, who had seemed enchanting in all she said and thought, was diffuse and silly. That was much. He couldn't really forgive the way that she was uh, inside herself, her character, her mentality. Flora, who had been spoiled and artless long ago, was determined to be spoiled and artless now. That was a fatal blow. The spoiled and artless young woman might have been charming, but to be behaving the same way in her forties, well, that wasn't charming. And Dickens broke off the contact and didn't have any more... Uh, interaction with Maria Biedenau. All right, after that early romance with Maria Biedenau, he met a woman and he married her. And in 1834, he came into contact with Catherine Hogarth. She was much more on his kind of social circuit, her father was a journalist, just as Dickens himself was, and things went along smoothly, and in 1836, he married her. Everything seems to have been going okay during the first few years. They went together to Scotland, they went together to America, and they had numerous children, ten children. But even before Dickens met Ellen Turnham, their marriage, his marriage with Catherine, was falling apart. They had separate bedrooms in 1857. They lived apart from 1858. They didn't formally divorce. As I say, they separated rather than divorcing. But uh, their marriage was over from this time on. Up until the marriage started to break down. Dickens, as I say, had ten children with Catherine. One of them died as an infant, but uh, it was a large family, not untypical for the Victorian period. People quite frequently had large families. Eight of the children, when the separation happened, remained with Dickens, and the eldest son moved in with the mother, who basically lost her husband and her children at that time. And she never really fully got over it. The general feeling is that Dickens behaved pretty badly during this period. Apart from anything else, a letter was published in the New York Tribune effectively uh, blaming Dickens' wife for the break breakdown of their relationship. It's not quite, it, it, he didn't actually intend it to be published. He didn't send it to the paper to have it published, but he, um, he was careless perhaps in allowing the letter to get into a position where it could be published. And it's right, see, it comes across as rather mean-spirited and unfair that he's blaming his wife for the breakdown in the relationship, particularly since he went on to form his own relationship with Nellie Turnham after that. And the opinion of his daughter, uh, his youngest daughter, by all accounts his favourite child, according to the other children, is again very negative. She, she's pretty clear that it's her father here who's behaving badly. 
Much later on, she said, my father was like a madman. This affair brought out all that was worst, all that was weakest in him. He did not care a damn what happened to any of us. Nothing could surpass the misery and unhappiness of our home. This is deeply ironic because Dickens maintained a very strong public image of himself as a good family man, a good uh, husband, and the private reality was really anything but. The image that he presented and the reality were completely at odds and uh, he he protected his image by partly by partly by blaming his wife really for the breakdown of the relationship and and uh, partly by asking the public to uh, accept that there should be a dignified silence over the whole issue and of course pa partly and quite importantly by keeping Nellie Turner and keeping her existence um, secret. Okay. One more person who needs to be talked about here is the dead sister-in-law. And she died very young, but Dickens never forgot her. Mary. It, it wasn't uncommon in those days for people to move in with their brother or sister's family, especially for a man to move in with his brother's family or uh, perhaps more often uh, a, a woman to move in uh, with her sister's family after the sister, especially an older sister, got married. And they would live in the same house and, and that would be uh, what happened in Mary's case. It, it happens in, again, in David Copperfield, for example, Traddles uh, marries his um, sweetheart and, and all his um, um, sisters-in-law all move in with him. I can't remember exactly how many there are now, but there are six or seven of them, I think. Something like that. So uh, this kind of thing was very typical. Well, Dickens praised her greatly. From the day of our marriage, he says, the dear girl had been the grace and life of our home, our constant companion, and the sharer of all our little pleasures. It's, it's going a little bit far, I think, to be saying that she was the grace and life of their home. It's, it's what one ex would expect him to say of his wife, that she was the grace and life of the home, not that his wife's sister was the grace and life of their home. It's not that there was any sexual relationship between them. I'm, I'm sure there wasn't, or it, it would be most unlikely or unseemly if there were. Dickens idealised her, and he really held her on a pedestal as a spiritual guide, as, a, as an absolutely wonderful human being. I'm sure there was no um, nothing as, as um, dirty and casual and simple as, 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 as in having a sexual relationship, but he was very, very attached to her, very much so. And when she died, uh, he was devastated. Of course, <laughs> Once she was dead, uh, she was always going to be perfect, wasn't she? She could never let him down. She could never dis disappoint him. She could never be anything other than that image of perfection that he had created for her in his mind. He described her as the chief solace of his labours. Again, that's a description that one would have expected to go to his wife. And for months after she died, he, he was dreaming of her. He even uh, took a ring from her finger when she died, which he continued to wear for the rest of his life. And he wrote that he thought one day of joining her again, where sorrow and separation are unknown. Again, that's something you would expect that he would say of his wife, that he would, that he would hope to be with the woman he loved in heaven. It really seems to be pushing it, that he's saying it of uh, uh, the younger sister, whom he knew only between the years of 14 and 17, because she died very young. But she had this huge impact on his life, and whenever he wanted to create, as he often did in his novels, um, a character, a female character of... Uh, a special purity, an ideal young woman, 
Rose Maley in Oliver Twist, Kate in Nicholas Nickleby. Whenever he wanted to create these kinds of characters, Little Nell in The Old Curiosity Shop, Lillian in The Chimes, Dot in The Cricket on the Hearth, Marion in The Battle of Life, the, uh, the Young Wife with No Name in The Haunted Man, Agnes in David Copperfield, all of these women are, to some extent, taken from the real-life model of Mary Hogarth, the young woman who died. So, where does that leave us then? Well, I haven't covered the complete ground. There are other women who played an important part in his life, but these are the romantic attachments that I've talked about here, the ones that he felt uh, drawn to um, in a sometimes an idealized way, but uh, certainly uh, was attracted to them as women. There's his mother, she would be an important influence in his life, and uh, there was another of the sisters, Georgina, uh, another of his wife's sisters, who, who was important in that she acted as his housekeeper for a long time. Uh, there was his favourite daughter, Kate, um, who we can see here with her art artist uh, husband, Charles Collins, who was the brother of the uh, author Wilkie Collins, and uh, Wilkie Collins was the author of um, Woman in White, The Woman in White, and uh, other uh, famous novels of that period. And uh, so her first husband was the the, the brother of the of the famous author. But mostly, we should not just be looking at these details of Dickens's life in themselves. He's not famous because of you know who he loved or who he married or who he didn't marry. Dickens is famous because of what he wrote. And what we need to do here is to be thinking about how do these relationships in his life throw light on his writings? How do they help us to understand his literary output? And uh, in the next part of this lesson, I'm going to be uh, looking at uh, how the experiences in his life that took place between the writing of David Copperfield, which has this positive picture of uh, wom womankind and gives David very kindly the chance to have two wives. The passionate love of his youth dies and then he marries the rather angelic character who perhaps is based on, on, on Mary Hogarth. Ten years later, he's well, roughly ten years later, he's writing, uh, publishing another work that has a much, much darker portrayal of a man and his relationships with women. There's the femme fatale Estella, who is frankly cruel, particularly in the early stages, um, who is um, a, a disaster, really, for, for uh, Pip, the central character, and Biddy, the practical, the, the, the perhaps the soulmate, sisterly kind of character, and poor Pip gets neither. So whereas David gets a double, double chance, a double, um, he gets a, he, a, a marriage, and then he has his wife die, and he's able to marry again, so he experiences the whole range of um, romance. Poor Pip gets nothing, and to understand how Dickens's life had changed, how his marriage had broken up, how he had met uh, Mary, Maria Beadnell again after 20 years and been disappointed by her, and how, how he had uh, found uh, his lover, Nellie Turnan. To understand those things would be a big step towards understanding the huge difference between those two particular novels. And that's the kind of thing that we might want to be interested in when we look at Dickens and the women in his life.